So just work with whatever does the best for you. Uh, so today we're looking at the disc. The, I find it interesting, the, the early work on the disc was done by a guy named William Marsden. And if you are a DC comic fan, you might recognize him as the creator of Wonder Woman. He also did some of the early pioneer work on the polygraph, the lie detector. So I, I guess the lie detector is in a way a lasso of truth. So that kind of fits with William Marsden's interests. Well, today we're not looking at DC Comics, but we're looking at the disc. And we're looking at it for self-understanding, to understand yourself better. And also to understand better how you maybe respond to crisis and pressure, which is what affects all of us in the midst of a pandemic like this. The disc was originally developed to help us understand the roles on a team and, a and the kind of roles that each of us play. So the disc is not about emotions, it's not about your feelings. It's about outwardly observable behavioral tendencies. For some reason, sometimes when I try to advance slides, I get funny noises. The DISC is not a personality assessment. Your personality is far more complicated than any tool. I think it was Jenny that said, the report on her said that she's a very complicated person or complex. That's true about all of us. Your DISC is just one dimension of who you are. And like any assessment tool, your DISC has margin of error. The DISC is not for the purpose of labeling yourself or another person. Sometimes we like to put people in a box and give them a label, but that's not the purpose of the disc. In fact, if you do that with the disc, then you're actually misapplying it, you're misusing it. It's not, there's not a right or wrong profile. There are a variety of profiles and they're all equally valid. They're all equally legitimate. There, we tend to think that my profile is the best profile because we're comfortable with ourselves generally. And that would be called assessment projection. It's dangerous. It can be irresponsible. You know, though, you may be the most wonderful person in the world. If you're part of a team and everybody else on the team is wired exactly like you are, then your team's gonna have a lot of blind spots and those will affect the team's effectiveness. To, to be a well-rounded team, you need to have somebody from the D, the I, the S, and the C profiles. There are preferable profiles for certain jobs or tasks. For example, you don't want somebody focusing on details who's hardwired to see the big picture. And you don't want somebody developing vision who's hardwired to only see the details. So while certain DISC profiles may be preferable for certain roles or certain tasks, there is not a preferred human profile. Part of our challenge is discovering how God has made us, how God has wired us, and then pursuing God in a way that honors him and how he's created us. I love this verse from Psalm 139. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You know, God has created every single one of us. He's given us personalities, behavioral tendencies, abilities, spiritual gifts, the likes. He's created us to be partners with him in his world. And part of that partnership is serving him as Christ's followers. You need to know the person you are is not an accident. Regardless of the circumstances surrounding your conception, you're created by God himself 
for a purpose. And I think that as we better understand ourselves, such as through a disc, then we're able, able to better understand how God has wired us for what he wants us to accomplish in life. And then though your disc may tend to be hardwired, it may change some over time. Or it may change because you get to know yourself better. So are you really changing or is just your self-awareness increasing? Kind of hard to know. It's kind of like the headache thing. Did your headache go away because you took the aspirin or was it going to go away anyway? Uh, did your disc change because you got to know yourself better or did it change because you've changed? Kind of hard to say. It's also important to recognize the context within which you take the DISC test. If you took the survey thinking about how you are at work, then you could be different at home. So if you take it at home and then you take it at work, you could actually have profiles that are a little bit different. There are gonna be similarities, but there could also be variations. So the context you're thinking about when you take the DISC can affect, to some degree, the outcome. Now the DISC describes behavioral tendencies by using four primary quadrants. We're gonna take a general flyby at those four quadrants, and then I wanna break them down a little bit more in detail. So the first quadrant is the D quadrant from DISC, and it really stands for direct and dominant. So the person who is high in the D scale is gonna be direct and dominant in their relationships with people. The person who's high on the I scale is going to be strong in influencing people relationally and inspiring people. And then somebody who's strong in the S scale, it stands for steadiness, supportive, and also sameness. S's tend to like routine. They like things to be the same from day to day. And then if you're high on the C quadrant, then you are probably a compliant person. You like to follow the rules. The, the rules. You're a critical thinker. And you're probably pretty conscientious as well. Now, D behaviors tell us how we respond to tasks, problems, challenges, or difficulties. But the I-scale tells us how we respond to new individuals we've just met, new circumstances, new situations we've encountered. The S, that tells us how we respond to the need for stability or the need for sameness or for security. And the C is how one responds to rules, regulations, details and procedures. So for example, if you're high in the C profile, then you tend to follow rules. You like regu regulations, you're a detailed person, and you follow procedures. You may even develop procedures. If you're really low in that scale, like Pastor Kurt is, then you don't like rules. You don't like regulations unless you've developed them and you want somebody else to take care of the details. Now this particular slide breaks the D, I, S, and C into four different quadrants. Let's look at each of the four quadrants and you'll notice it's going to identify information about each quadrant. But as we do this, just keep in mind that you and everybody else scored high in at least one quadrant. By high, I mean probably over the 50% mark and maybe even well over that 50% mark. So everybody scores high in at least one quadrant. Most people score high in two of the quadrants, which can kind of mellow out some of the characteristics. A few people score high in three quadrants. Only Jesus scores high in all four. So if you scored high in all four, we may need to have a little conversation. You may, may have a little bit of a Messiah complex because only Jesus is the one who's gonna fit that. Now in a moment, as I describe each quadrant, 
keep in mind that when you describe a person that's got two or three different quadrants above that 50% midline, it will modify and at times temper some of the descriptions that I'm going to give. That can make a person's profile a little more complex to understand, but I think it's also a part of the uniqueness of each person. So let's look at the D. Characteristics of the D. They tend to be fast paced, task oriented. They're looking to accomplish something. Ds are decisive. They make decisions quick and pretty easily. They have take charge personality. They are self-confident people. Now they may not always feel self-confident, but they tend to always come across as being self-confident. So Ds are the people who see a hill and they're gonna take the hill. That's the challenge. And they wanna mobilize people to take the hill, but frankly, if nobody else goes with them, they're still gonna take the hill. So Ds in the process of taking the hill can become really impatient, especially at people who don't move quickly. They can be stubborn. We take the hill my way, my way or the highway. And Ds can be a bit blunt with their words because frankly, if I'm a D and I've got a hill to take, I don't have time to be nice with my words. I gotta get going up that hill. So either go with me or get out of the way. Now, each of the quadrants also have fears associated with them. For example, the person who's wired as a high D, they fear being taken advantage of by other people. And if you keep me from taking the hill, or you slow me down in taking it, then you've taken advantage of me. There's also communication styles that are a bit unique to each of the four quadrants. And the communication style of the D, it's one way, D's talk, everybody else listens. And they're very direct in their communication. It's very bottom line oriented. And D's ask where questions because they're interested in getting to a destination. There's your D profile. The higher you are on the scale, the stronger these characteristics will be in your, in your life. If you are only uh, above the midline in the D quadrant, then these characteristics on steroids will describe you, okay? And here's the I quadrant. The characteristics of a high I, they're inspiring. They love people contact. They can't get enough of people. They're fun loving, optimistic. They love solving people problems. They're enthusiastic, they're animated, they're good communicators, and they're very verbal. They tend to talk a lot. So if you're around somebody who's very, very talkative, then there's a chance that person is gonna be a high eye. So high eyes, they're about relationships, and the more the merrier. They like crowds that are big. The, the more people you can get at a party, the more fun the party's gonna be. And they love being around other high eyes as long as they don't have to share the platform too much. Because eyes have a need for people to notice them. Ds have a need to take charge. Eyes have a need for people to value them and like them. Well, the limitations of the high eye, they tend to be disorganized because they're about people. They don't like details. They think they're unimportant. And high eyes can be unrealistic. They can be so doggone positive all the time that in stressful situations, they might even come across as being glib because the gla glass isn't just half full, it's 80% full, even if there's not but two drops at the bottom of it. Now the fear that drives the high eye is a loss of social approval. They have a need to be liked by others. And so they fear being rejected by other people. Communication style, they're very positive. They're inspiring. They're persuasive. They're oftentimes trying to sway somebody to see something like they do. And they ask who questions. 
if you ask a high D, if you invite a high D to a party, they're going to ask, where is the party? You invite a high I to a party, and they're going to ask who's going to the party. Because if it's not going to be fun people, they're going to be somewhere else. And then there's the S quadrant. Characteristics tend to be very patient, usually very easygoing people. They wear well. They're a team player. They want the team to win. They want to help the team. I call S's the social lubricant, the relational lubricant that makes a team work. They are steady. They're systematic. They like routine. They will organize things. And they also bring a calming influence because emotionally, they don't get very excited about things. They don't get keyed up about things. Now, the limitations of the S profile is they can have a hard time making decisions. So you, you ask them where they want to eat. You ask them what they want to do. Uh, I, I, I don't know. What do you want to do? Where do you want to eat? I, I don't really care. They can also be overly accommodating. In, in other words, you can ask them, do you want to do this? And they'll nod their head yet, yet, head yes. You ask them if they want to do the opposite, they'll nod their heads yes. So they tend to be very agreeable. What a S fears is losing stability. S's have a high need for security. So when there are stressful events, when there are things that upset routine, it can be unnerving to them. Emotionally, they're not going to get very high or very low, but the stress can be, uh, can be pervasive in their spirit, though they may not let you know they're really feeling a high level of stress. Communication style of the high S, they're great two-way listeners. When you're sharing something with a high S, you've got their full attention. They're nodding. They're saying back, so this is how you feel. Yeah, oh, I understand. And they really do. They're very empathetic people, extremely encouraging, and they just have a natural knack at being supportive. Now, S's ask how questions because they're going to organize it. They're going to make a system out of it. So they need to understand how things work, how things fit together, so that they can develop the steps in order to accomplish something. So if you're on a team, for example, you need a D in order to bring some direction to the team and some decisiveness. You need an I in order to make it fun. But you need an S in order to get work done. Because S's are the people who do a lot of the work. Now, you've also got C's. And the role they play on the team is they're the detailed person. So the characteristics, they are high in accuracy. They love analyzing facts and data. They're extremely detailed. They're perfectionistic, especially if they're high on the C scale then they're probably going to be fairly perfectionistic. They also have high standards. They want things to be done at a high level of quality. And they're very self-controlled. Sometimes they're self-controlled by pushing their emotions down. But even when everybody else around them is losing their heads, they're going to remain self-controlled because they tend to be a little bit stoic in their wiring. Now, seeds, the limitation, they can be too critical, both of themselves and other people. And they can be overly sensitive. Now, here's what I mean by that. You can tell from the characteristics that C's want to get it right. So, for example, if a C is a student, whether it's elementary all the way to graduate school, and they have an assignment, they want to do the assignment perfectly. So C sometimes procrastinate while they're waiting to figure out how to do it perfectly. And if a C writes a paper and the teacher says, oh, you've got one comma on this paper that you shouldn't have, therefore making a comma splice, here's what a C hears. You're an absolute failure in every area of your life. You can't ever do anything right. 
So the unrealistic high standards for a C can make them a bit sensitive to criticism. In fact, criticism is what they fear. They fear making mistakes because they try to think through everything in order to get it right the first time. Communication style of the high C, they're very diplomatic, always looking for just the right word. They provide a lot of detail when they communicate, usually more detail than anybody in the room wants, especially a D or an I. And they ask a lot of why questions because they need to understand why you're doing something. And they also sometimes have some how curiosity so they understand how things fit together. So there are the four quadrants that kind of make sense to you, the behavioral tendencies of each one. Now, I said a little while ago that most people are a combination of two quadrants. And normally it's two adjacent quadrants. So for example, someone might be high on D and I. They may be high on I and S. They may be high on S and C. They may be high on C and D. But we don't find a lot of people who are diagonally high in two quadrants. In other words, we don't find many who are DSs or SDs. We don't find many who are ICs or CIs, but there are some. In fact, one of my kids is an IC. Now, look at the characteristics of an I and the characteristics of a C. They're pretty opposite, aren't they? And that's why we don't find a lot of people with a diagonal profile. Now, imagine being a high I and you don't like details and being a high C and you love details and you've got a decision to make. You're gonna look at details and you're gonna hate looking at details and yet you've gotta make a decision. And so you're, you're kind of caught between some opposite characteristics that are pulling you in two different directions. Or look at the D and the S. The Ds are decisive, Ss tend to be indecisive. So if you're a DS, there's some things you're gonna be decisive about, and there's some things you're gonna have trouble making a decision about. And you're gonna feel this internal tension that will pull you into opposite directions. So it's important that you understand that's okay. That's how you're wired. It also gives you some unique insights, and you're able to function in ways that people with other profiles can't. So there are upsides to being diagonal, but there are also downsides, and you have to learn to make peace with that, or you'll basically drive yourself crazy. If you look at the top and the bottom of the screen, you'll see at the top, Ds and Is are fast-paced, high energy. The Cs and Ss are moderate-paced, moderate energy. And, and honestly, sometimes they're just playing low pace, low energy. And then look on the right-hand side. You'll see that I's and S's are people-oriented. And then left side, D's and C's are task-oriented. So if you've got somebody who has a DC profile, they're gonna be double-dose task. Or somebody who's IS, they're gonna be double-dose people. If somebody's a D and a C, they're gonna be sometimes fast paced, sometimes low pace. If they're an IS, sometimes high energy, sometimes low energy. So keep in mind when you have two traits or more, it provides a mixture that kind of moderates some of the tendencies, especially some of the excesses of a particular profile. Are you still with me? Okay, here's an important thing to understand when it comes to leadership. Ds and Is think they have the power to change the world, but they see the world differently and therefore they go about trying to change the world differently. Ds view the world as pushing back on them, so they try to use force to change the world, the force of their personality which means if you push back against a D, guess what they do? They get louder, they get more forceful, 
They use more energy because they're trying to bring about change. But eyes view the world as inviting change. So to the eye, the world says, change me. And so they use their charm. They use woo, winning others over in order to change the world. Now, C's and S's aren't so sure they've got the power to change the world. In fact, they feel like they don't. They feel like the world's more powerful. So they want to cope with their little slice of the world. C's do that by trying to increase quality. So they focus on quality control. Let's make the different pieces of my world better. Let's improve things. And S's focus on creating stability and security for themselves because that brings a greater degree of satisfaction for them. Now, each quadrant handles conflict differently, but all four quadrants have competing behaviors. They just look very different. We're most familiar with the D in conflict. The emotion that drives the D is anger. They're angry the world is the way it is, so they want to change it. And the competing behavior is when there's conflict, they become driving, even more driving in their personality. They become really aggressive. They try to use the strength of their personality to win. Now, when an I is in conflict, their behavior is very different from a D. The emotion driving the I is optimism. But they do have a competing behavior, and that is they engage in inspired talking. So when a D's competing, you know it because they're pushing back against you and they're getting loud. But when an I is competing, they'll talk you to death. Endless conversation. And, and really what the I is hoping is that you'll get tired of them talking and you'll give in to what they want to do. Okay, so they're trying to win by talking you to death. Now, C's, the emotion that drives the C is fear. They have a competing behavior, and it's asking painstaking questions. So when you toss out an idea and the C doesn't like it, they'll ask you 50,000 questions, not because they really want to know the answer, but because at some point they hope you'll give up on the idea. Okay? So a C always has another question to ask. And the I, the, the S, the emotion is non-detectable. They're pretty flatlined emotionally. So you're not going to see them get up or down but they do compete. And the way S's compete to win is they nod their heads in agreement, and then they have a tendency to be passive aggressive and do what they wanna do. So when an S says yes, it doesn't always mean yes. It may mean I'm telling you yes so that you'll leave me alone so I can really do what I wanna do, okay? Now we're gonna start looking at the graphs. So take a look at your disk graph, and you'll have a page where it will show both of these graphs. Now, yours may say adapted on the left and natural on the right. The orders may differ, but you'll see two graphs, one natural, one adapted. We'll get to the adapted in just a minute. But your natural graph just describes how you tend to be when you're being you, okay? When you're being your true self or your core self. So in disk terminology, a person is regarded as having a high score in a quadrant if that scores over the midline, which is 50. That's the bold line drawn through the middle of the graph. Now, 55 is high, but also is 100. So obviously there's a big difference between someone who's 55 on the D and someone who's 100 on the D. The higher you are in the score, the more those traits pertain to you the lower you are on that score, and any of those four, then the, the less those characteristics describe you. So this happens to be my graph. And you see on the D, I'm in 86. And then my next highest is 62, that's the C. So on the D, I'm at a high scale. On the C, I'm at a moderately high scale. But I also have a little bit of I. It just barely creeps above the midline. And so my I is mid. But then look at my S. It's super low at eight. So on, on disterminology, I would be a very high D, 
moderately high C, middle high I, and a very low S. Now look at your adapted graph. It may be virtually a mirror image of your natural style, so that's good. But for a lot of people, our adapted style changes a little bit in one, two, or maybe even all four of the quadrants. The adaptive style describes how you tend to behave under less than perfect circumstances. In other words, it's how you adapt when you feel stress in your life or pressure. Or if you did it at work and your boss has some expectations of you that don't really fit your natural tendencies, you may adapt to meet the expectations your boss has or the expectations you think your boss has. So ideally, we want the natural style and the adapted style to be the same, but that's not always the case. Sometimes they vary because you feel like the, the context or the environment that you're in expects you to behave differently than you're naturally wired, so you adjust to it. Well, let's take my adaptive disc as, an, disc as an example. Notice what happens to my profile. My D drops eight points. My C increases 15 points. And then my eye tanks, it drops 22 points. So all of a sudden, I function as a DC under stress, or maybe a CD, because they're both really the, the close. And so I'm focused on the big picture, and I'm focused on the details, and I'm trying to figure out how to take the hill. And then I repress the eye. So basically, what little relational piece is a natural part of my wiring, I throw that out the window. Because under stress or pressure, I got to get things done. I want to press ahead. And so I want to look at that as an assessor if I see a change from the adapted and the natural style. And I want to ask why. Why does the D drop? Why does the C go up? Why is the I repressed? In order to try to better understand the person being assessed, which in this case is me. Now, let me just say quickly. A DIS does not identify your level of maturity or immaturity. It doesn't take into account your family of origin issues, any dysfunctions you have, or any pathologies. And we all have issues. We all have dysfunctions. But it's not a forensic assessment tool. There are tools that assess that. The DIS does not. But if your adapted graph differs quite a bit from your natural graph, there might be some things going on with your family of origin issues or with some dysfunctional issues that you have. Not that doesn't have to be, but there could be. Now, I've been able to figure out from looking at a number of assessment tools and talking to other assessors kind of what's going on with my profile. For example, I adapt. Both of my parents were born in 1928 during the Great Depression. They were the oldest of multiple siblings. They grew up in rural America. Both of them were on the naturally serious side. Though they don't realize that when I was growing up, I picked up a lot of comments my parents made about people who engaged in eye behaviors. And the way they described them was they were frivolous, immature, irritating. And I got the message from my parents. Eye behaviors are undesirable. They really like C behaviors. Both of them have a lot of C. So whenever I evidenced any type of I behavior, my parents let me know that my behavior needed to change. And if they shamed me, not knowing, it wasn't intentional, it wasn't on purpose. But I realize now that I experienced some shaming when I acted the least bit I-ish. So what I learned to do was repress I behavior, elevate C behavior, because that's what my parents value, and then slightly toned down the D behavior because that wasn't valued so much when I was a kid. And so by understanding those things about myself, I understand the adaptations that are going on in my behavioral tendencies and, and really how I'm feeling inside about that, okay? So 
you don't have time to do it right now, but maybe this evening or tomorrow, sit down with your graph. If you're married, sit down with your spouse. Talk about how you adapt, okay? Because the way you adapt to COVID is probably reflected in this particular graph. So get an understanding of maybe why you might be adapting as a person. Look back at family of origin, look back at some major events in your life. They may give you some understanding. Uh, for example, some of you may be, may be CS or SC, yet your parents are both DI and ID. And you may be adapting some behaviors in order to try to meet your parents' expectations. Okay, let's go ahead and move on and start talking about cumulative stress for just a minute. So I'm gonna actually skip this side, let's jump to cumulative stress. This is the stress that, where you have stress piling on top of stress, piling on top of stress. You know, one layer of stress is enough to deal with. But with COVID-19, all of a sudden, we have multiple layers of stress in our lives. Because COVID-19 has affected work, it's affected home, it's affected school, it's affected play, it's even affected how we go to the grocery store. And all of these changes create stress upon stress upon stress. So if you took your disc recently and you were in the context of COVID-19, even your natural disc may be a little bit affected by the stress you're feeling caused by COVID-19. You just want to keep that in mind. You've probably noticed people all around you responding differently to the stress. There are some people who stay at home and others who protest stay at home. There are people who engage in heroic behavior to take care of people with the virus, even at risk to themselves, first responders. There are people who have meltdowns. There are people who can't handle the stress in some way and it's affecting their relationships with others. And they may even become abusive or more abusive. It may heighten prejudice. Look at what happened for the last couple of months in the United States. Uh, all the racial tension and the behaviors that some people have engaged in, which have, have been depicted on the news. Uh, it can really trigger a lot of things like prejudice and anxiety feelings inside of people. You probably know some people wear a mask, they're obsessed with it. Others refuse to wear a mask. Some are confident they're going to do okay, and some are scared to death. The crisis means the end of the world. Now look again at your adaptive disc. That's probably how you'll be tempted or you'll tend to respond behaviorally to the current crisis. Now keep in mind, if, you're, if an adaptive component varies by as much as, oh, I guess, 8 to 10 percentage points from your natural disc, then that's a significant adaptation. If it's two points, five points, seven points, it's not a big deal. But if it's about eight to 10 points, points more or less, that's a significant adaptation. And most of the time when we adapt, we adapt from our strengths to our weaknesses. In other words, you might be a high D and you're good at taking charge, but if you're adapting and your D goes up, you probably become overbearing. So all of a sudden, take charge becomes undesirable in an overbearing expression, okay? So you want to ask yourself, which of your quadrants, which of your DIS or C, increase by 8 to 10 points or more? And then ask yourself, why? Why is your behavior adapting? Identify which one of these decreases by 8 to 10 points or more. And then ask yourself again, why? What, what's going on? Why, why am I doing that? How are my behaviors changing? What am I doing differently than when I'm my, my normal self? So I hope that makes sense to you. Spend a little time unpacking that and trying to understand yourself and what kind of strengths. Are your strengths going excessive on steroids and being unhealthy and unproductive? Or are they becoming really, really low? Are they, are they tanking? Therefore, you're, you're missing some valuable strengths that you normally bring to the table. 
Now let's have a little fun with this. And let's talk a little more about disk profiles, specifically in, in light of the COVID crisis. So when you look at this, we've got all four quadrants up. And I've got bullets under each one that identifies what is probably that profile's behavior under the stress created by COVID-19. Now let's break that down. Let's look at the D. Ds are probably confident they won't get sick. They won't wear a mask, okay? They're just not gonna do it. They resist rules unless they made them. They continue to work if the job allows. Frankly, they're probably gonna to continue to work even if the job doesn't allow unless they specifically have to be physically present at their workplace. They're gonna find a way to keep working because they've got hills to take. They're gonna tackle goals, to-do lists with vigor, may get a whole bunch of projects done around the house that they put off for a while. They're gonna be irritated that others are not as task-oriented or productive as they are. So if anybody's gonna call somebody else being lazy or being a lazy bum, it's probably gonna be a high D. They don't need advice from others. They've got it figured out. They're apt to believe this whole COVID thing is a conspiracy. And they may even be feeling a little angry at the government for overreaching their authority. So that wouldn't describe every single D, but those, this, these would tend to be how Ds would respond in this crisis. Now, what about the high eyes? Uh, they're not worried about that. They're not, they're not worried about much of anything. Remember, if you got two drops in the glass, it's almost full. They will comply when it's convenient. So they'll wear a mask if it's convenient, but they may also forget about the mask. They're gonna to get together with others. Although it may be a little more of a limited environment and they may not post photos online because they don't want other people to know they're breaking the rules because those people won't like them and they wanna be liked. But they gotta to get together with other people. They're gonna set up online gatherings. So they're gonna figure out how do you play euchre, pinochle, and do those kind of things online. They're gonna have online parties. They're gonna to go to stores still, and they're either not gonna wear a mask because they forgot it, or they're gonna wear a really fun mask and have a good time with this. They believe that most people are overreacting in the crisis especially those who say it's not gonna be over for nine to 12 months, they're convinced it's gonna be over really soon. And they're gonna have a party when it's over. But in the meantime, they're gonna whine about missing their friends because this is really infringing on their lifestyle. So what about the S? The high S, they're not gonna to be too worried or focused on specifics. They don't usually worry a lot about that. They're accepting of rules, but they're not real strict on following them, so they might wear a mask. They're happy to stay at home if the job allows. They will stay very calm. They won't get too excited emotionally or too down. They're really happy they can sleep late now. They enjoy time at home being alone. This is a good excuse to watch TV. They're content with no schedule. They intend to get some do-it-yourself projects or crafts done, and, and just as soon as they get around to it. And then there's the high C, the conscientious, the critical thinker. The high C worries about getting sick. And if they get sick, they think about the implication that they're gonna lose their job. They follow all the rules. They will wear a mask to the bathroom when they're driving in the car. They enjoy staying at home if their job will let them. They know every statistic available. They look at the John Hopkins website every day to see what changes have taken place. They watch every daily news briefing. They have their groceries and their food delivered to their house. They use spreadsheets and inventories to track all the foods and supplies. They use their time at home to organize things, and they're depressed over the global economic impact, and they're worried the market's not gonna re recover anytime soon. So those are the four profiles. 
and how the current crisis, the pandemic, may be affecting them. Keep in mind, the higher you are in your score in one of those, the more likely these characteristics will describe you. But the lower you are, the less likely they're to describe you. Now let's talk about behavioral tendencies in general for each profile when we're under stress or pressure because these will be the kinds of behaviors that an adapted disc will tend to draw out into the surface, okay? So with the D, when the D is under pressure, there's gonna be a heightened sense of urgency. Everything needs to be done yesterday. So they're gonna have a short fuse. They're gonna be very impatient. They can be caustic towards other people. They'll see things in black and white, right and wrong probably come across as overconfident, not gonna ask permission, may not even ask forgiveness later. They will over-delegate and over-direct other people. They can be blunt, insensitive, undiplomatic. Don't tend to listen when they're under stress, too busy directing others. Under stress, they can become very overbearing and self-focused, even be seen as self-centered. And Ds under stress can have tunnel vision on accomplishing tasks that they think are critical for taking that hill. Now, Is under pressure, they can become even more impulsive, unrealistic, and overly optimistic. And they may promise things they can't deliver. Under stress, Is may be even less interested in details, may become frazzled, unorganized, can be overly trusting of other people, and may become really unrealistic in assessing what other people can do. They may agree with everybody, even people who say the opposite thing, because they want to be liked. And under pressure, high eyes don't tend to listen. So S is under pressure. They can quickly feel overwhelmed become even more indecisive than usual. They can feel fearful and hesitant in changing environments. They, that can make them slow to move without some sense of clear direction. Instead of delegating to other people to share the load, they'll typically try to do everything on their own. They'll push down or internalize their feelings, though they can feel taken advantage of people. S's often feel taken advantage of by D's anyway, even though they need D's to kind of give them direction, but especially under pressure and stress, S's can really feel taken advantage of by D's. They're gonna depend on others. They're not gonna be expressive of their emotions and may even come across as emotionless. And under pressure, S's will tend to be passive aggressive. They'll nod, they'll agree, they'll say, yes, let's do that, and then they'll go do whatever it is they want to do. And then the C's under pressure. They hesitate to act without a precedent because they need to have those guidelines or procedures to know what to do. They can even become more paralyzed by information, especially when it's contradictory or inadequate information. They get stuck in the system they're comfortable with and in set ways of doing things. They can be afraid to take risks, so they play it safe. They may repress their feelings, be real stoic, even shut their feelings down. C's like to work alone anyway. You throw them in a crisis like COVID-19, they may have a tendency to willingly withdraw. They may give in to others when faced with argument or conflict, just not want to waste the energy on it they may come across as overly critical. Under pressure, C's may fear even more making mistakes, therefore they don't do anything. And they will follow the rules, unless it's a rule that they feel is really, really, really wrong. And if it's a rule that violates their sense of justice or what's right, they'll ignore a rule, but generally, they're gonna follow all the rules, especially in the event of crisis. Well, now that you have this basic understanding of DISC profiles, all four quadrants, 
and have a basic understanding of your profile and what you tend to do normally and what you tend to adapt to when you're under pressure or stress. Now let's take some time and talk quickly about resiliency. Now, resiliency is about bouncing back from adversity, failure, or a stressful traumatic event like COVID-19. Being resilient doesn't mean that you don't struggle or that you don't make mistakes, but being resilient means that you press forward and you don't let the setbacks defeat you, though they may trip you up. Now, people with different behavioral tendencies are stressed by different things. And we react to stress in different ways. For example, for you lose control in a crisis, that's stressful to a D, but not so stressful to an I. Taking orders, that's stressful to Ds because they like to give orders, but taking orders doesn't really create stress for an S because that gives them a clear way of knowing how to act. Slow decision making, Ds and Is go crazy but not S's and C's, they need time to process things. Not being liked, oh, that'll kill an I. They really need to be liked by others. But D's and C's could care less if you like them because it's all about improving things or taking the hill. Precision, detail, that will absolutely take the energy and life right out of a high I. But not a C, they can spend hours lost in precision and detail. Being alone will tend to stress an I and an S, but not a C and a D. And S is even like being alone a little bit. Public speaking, that can really stress out an S and a C, but usually not an I or a D. They're, they're gonna be comfortable with that because they're used to talking a lot always. Change, S's and C's do not like change. That creates stress, but not for D's and I's, they thrive on change and innovation. So understand what stresses you. Your behavioral profile will give you some clues because it identifies the kinds of things your personality needs in order to function at your best. So if you take away that, like a D needs control, you take away control and Ds may become overbearing and not function at their best. So understand what stresses you. Now I want to identify some good resiliency practices. And these practices actually apply to all of us, regardless of our profile. Okay, How you apply it may look a little different. The degree to which you apply it may vary. But these are practices that help all of us be more resilient in the midst of crisis, pressure, and stress. Take a deep breath. And then take another. Allow yourself some time to think and regroup. Ds need this because they don't tend to take breaths at all. They're just moving straight ahead. And Ss need to take multiple breaths because they're feeling overwhelmed. But whether your profile is DIS or C, you need to stop in the midst of crisis and stress and take some deep breaths. Slow down. Accept the reality of your situation. You know, life is full of challenges. Rarely do we ask for any of them. In the midst of the challenge, you have to refuse to see yourself as a victim. Blaming others, blaming external causes, that won't help you bounce back. It will actually keep you down. Ask yourself, what am I feeling and why am I feeling this way? Now, if you're not aware of your emotions, then you're not going to be able to regulate their expression very effectively or very healthfully. Ask, how am I coming across to others? You know, it's really good for a D who can be turbocharged to take the hill or the C who can be turbocharged with details and get a little bit edgy and, and caustic. But also for the eye, because eyes may talk you to death in the midst of crisis. And S's, they may have a tendency to withdraw. So ask yourself, how am I coming across to other people? 
All four quadrants need to connect with others during crisis in order to be resilient. We're created as social beings. Even if we're DCs and we're high task oriented, we need people, especially during a crisis. So you need to stay connected with people, especially people who are wise, who help you think clearly, who are safe, and who can help you process what's happening externally and what's happening inside of you. If you connect with people who are high maintenance and needy, it's liable to drain you. So you have to be a little bit selective in who you connect with during a time of crisis or stress in order to facilitate your bouncing back. Another good practice is self-care. Now, it's easy for us to ignore self-care until we find ourselves pushed over the edge. Our emotional, our energy batteries, they can drain rapidly, but they recharge slowly. They recharge at a trickle charge. So no matter what your profile is, you've got to build margin. You've got to build pace into every day. And you're probably going to have to strategize in order to do that. But if you don't practice self-care, if you don't have some margin, if you don't have some pace, if you don't take care of you, whether your profile is DIS or C, you're going to struggle to be resilient. Ask yourself the question, how can I grow through this experience? You know, every experience, even a pandemic, can teach us some things about ourselves, about others, and about life in general. A growth mindset says, what can I learn from this? What new skills can I develop? How can I develop myself as a person to be a, a better contributor, to be more effective? A fixed mindset doesn't ask the grow question. A fixed mindset responds rigidly. They think that the, the qualities, the wiring, the characteristics is kind of locked into a fatalistic level. And so it really doesn't matter what they do or how they respond. This is going to play out however it does. And so that fixed mindset can actually cause you to, to kind of get depressed and withdraw and not plug into life in a very healthy manner. So ask yourself, am I a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? Carol DeWick, D-W-E-C-K, has written a book called Mindsets. It's a great resource to read right now because it plays strongly into resiliency. Like my birth family conditioned me to have more of a fixed mindset, but by reading Carol DeWick and some others and being around some other people, I've opted for a growth mindset. And then respond, don't react. In other words, develop some kind of a plan. Even if you're a high eye, develop some kind of plan to guide you and work it. You know, in a riptide, they say, don't waste your energy by trying to swim back to shore because you're swimming against the current and it will wear you out and defeat you. Instead, it says either ride the riptide a little bit or swim horizontally to the shore. Same thing in a crisis. If you just react, you're trying to swim into a riptide and you're going to have trouble getting to shore. It will wear you out. It will defeat you. But if you're able to respond, then you can swim horizontal to the shore, or you can kind of wait until there's a break in the riptide and have the energy for moving forward. So let's quickly get real specific. A couple of things that each profile needs to do to be resilient. So if you're a high D, to be resilient, you need to slow down. Everything is not as ultra urgent as you feel like it is. You need to stay out of your tank. By that, I mean your army tank that you get in. When everybody is not complying with what you want, we like to get in our tanks, plow up that hill, and leave dead bodies laying around. we got to stay out of the tank if we're going to be resilient. We've got to be flexible. Our way or the highway isn't a real good way to go. We need to listen. Now, D's don't listen well under normal circumstances. You throw us into a crisis, 
and it's even worse, but we've got to slow down enough to listen to other people. We also need to ask, what do those around me need to navigate this pandemic? You know, we can get tunnel vision just on ourselves, but we need to help other people in the midst of, especially if you're a high D and your spouse is not. If crisis causes your D to go up, then your spouse needs some things from you that you will never provide unless you learn to be resilient in the midst of the crisis. And then when it comes to a mask, if you're a high D, if it makes other people feel safe, wear it. This is not just about you. And if you're a D, then you need to be resilient. You need to pace yourself. And you need to pace your rate of change. Everything doesn't have to be changed before you go to bed tonight. What about a high I in resiliency? Well, an I, you need to remain positive. Don't lose that but don't get glib. You also need to influence people positively because that helps other people get through the crisis. Avoid working alone. The more you're alone, the less energy you're gonna have. Lean on the S and C for details because you need some details, but they're gonna wear you out. Find ways to connect with others. You need those relationships. You won't bounce back without doing that. And don't get so busy talking that you're not listening. Listening will help you be more resilient. And if wearing a mask makes other people feel safe, wear one. Forgetting it is not a good excuse. And eyes, you need to pace yourself as well. That will help you bounce back. If you're an S, in order to be resilient, take a breath, then another, then another. Embrace some of the changes that are happening. You can't live in a world that doesn't change in the midst of a crisis like this. So if you will learn to adapt some and embrace some changes, it will help you be more resilient. Let others help you make a decision. You're gonna to have to make some, let them help you. That'll help you bounce back. Though you may be fearful, don't shame yourself for being fearful. That's not gonna help anybody. Create some new routines, create some new structures. That'll help put new energy back into you. Share some tasks, delegate some things to other people. That'll help you bounce back. And speak up. You may have a really good idea that other people need to hear, but because D's are so busy taking charge and I's are so busy talking, you may have a good idea and just sit on it, speak up. We need to hear what you think. Talk about your feelings. Don't just repress them. Don't swallow them. Talk about them with somebody that you trust. And go ahead and wear a mask, even if other people don't. If it makes you feel better, do it for you. And then be careful. Don't be passive aggressive. That's not going to help you. It's not going to help anybody else. So watch the tendency to say no outwardly while inside your head saying, I'm not about to do that. Just be honest with people. And then if you're a C, in order to be resilient, realize there are very few precedents during a once in a lifetime pandemic. So be flexible. You'll love yourself for it. Understand that mistakes aren't an enemy. Paralysis is. Make the best decision you can with the information you have. No, it's not enough, but do the best you can. That'll help you bounce back. Realize that not taking a risk can be one of the riskiest things you do. Admit if your current system's not working, then create a new one. As much as you want to, don't withdraw from others. That doesn't mean you have to be around others 24 seven. You need some time for yourself, but don't hide from others. Being with others will help you bounce back. Face and monitor your feelings. Don't yell at other people who are not wearing a mask. That's not gonna help anything. Wear a mask if it makes others feel safe, even if you've read a document that gives 450 reasons why wearing, why wearing masks are not effective. If it makes others feel safe, do it. Guard against being negative or toxic and talk through conflict without being caustic towards others. So some final thoughts. 
understanding how your disc adapts can help you monitor your behavioral tendencies. And if you monitor them, it helps you not escalate some into an unhealthy expression or de-escalate some traits and behaviors into an unhealthy expression. And remember, DISC's not the only thing that affects how you respond. There's other things, maturity, emotional intelligence, self-talk, how you handle anxiety, mindset, spiritual maturity. Keep in mind that a crisis like this can bring things to the surface that maybe we thought we had resolved or dealt with a long time ago. But stuff in our lives that's not adequately resolved, there's something about a uh, crisis like this that just amplifies or magnifies it. And in some way, we've all been affected by our family of origin. And, and we've all got issues. We've all got some dysfunctions at some level. They can be pathological, especially in the midst of a crisis. So it's a great opportunity in a crisis to deal with them. So if it surfaces from dysfunctional behavior surface, some excesses that strain relationships, don't shame yourself, but also don't give in to them. And by all means, don't self-medicate. Instead, thank God for using the crisis for revealing some things in your life that need to be addressed. Talk to God about it. Find a good counselor. Remember, in the words of Stanford economist Paul Romer, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Use it as a learning opportunity. Well, you survived DISC 101, 102, 103, and 104. And hopefully you understand yourself a little bit better and some of your tendencies, how stress affects it, but also people you work with, people you go to church with, your spouse. Now, it's usually not helpful for a child to take a disc. Somewhere between 18 and 25, we go through a lot of, of development as a person. So I know some 18, 20 year olds who have done it. So you may have have a kid who's taken it, but don't lock them into that too much because they're still at a heavy discovery phase. But if you're uh, beyond that 20, 25, 30 age bracket, um, then hopefully the disc will give you some insight into behaviors, how you're responding in the midst of all of this. So Kurt, there you go, Chris. There you go. I'm happy to answer some questions if anybody still has the energy and the time to stay around for a few minutes. Yeah, first, thank you, Doug, for, uh, for taking the time to do this. I, I learn something every single time, and hopefully it's been helpful to you, uh, even if you've understood the disc. Um, if you need to jump off, by all means, feel free to do that. Nobody's going to look bad or shame, or, or uh, we, we're right at time right now. But um, if you have questions, just throw them in the chat. One question that came in, Doug, is um, what does it mean if all four scores change by 20 points you know, in the, uh, from adapted to natural? So what, what could be some of the reasons for that? Um, you know, it, it, could, it could very well be some family of origin stuff. Uh, we are all shaped by the family we grew up in. Whether you were uh, raised as a foster system, um, whether you were raised by child protective services, whether you had one parent, two parents, we're all affected. And that didn't mean our parents are bad people if we have family of origin issues. Uh, you know, our kids respond to us differently than we think they do because their wiring is different from our wiring. It's like my parents with the, the eyepiece. Um, I have an uncle whose name is Ted. He's my favorite uncle, uh, as far as the one I got to see the most. 10 years older than me. Ted's the biggest cut up in the world. Everybody loves Ted. Uh, my parents said at multiple times, quit acting like your brother Ted, your, your uncle Ted. You know, and that shamed me. And so I knew that wasn't appreciated. So stuff like that, they weren't trying to do that, but a lot of times family of origin or some unresolved stuff in our lives can trigger a significant adaptation. So that, that might be if your scores are, are greatly divergent, you might wanna get with somebody who's, who's like a counselor and understands a little bit about the disc 
and can help you maybe navigate some stuff from family of origin, or it could be some other trauma or stuff in your life that's happened and you just haven't processed it enough mm -hmm. yet. And in the case of, uh, in one case here, this would be somebody who would fall into that 18 to 25 year range. So um, is that also still in the process of being formed, developed? Um, how I respond to certain situations can swing in that in those moments? Yeah, it, it really can because, you know, when you're in that 18 to 25, really 18 to 28, uh, you know, we, we know the brain isn't fully developed until we hit about 25 to 28 years old. Therefore, our behavioral patterns, though they may have some tendencies, they're not as set. And so we're kind of experimenting behaviorally. We're, we're seeing how does, it, how does it go when I act this way? Okay, that didn't work too well, so now I'm gonna try this way. So you, you may experience more shift in behavioral tendencies until you hit that later 20s or 30s. And, and even when you get up in 40s and 50s, if you, you may work on an area and try not to repress it. Like I've been trying not to repress the eye during the crisis. And my wife who's on the call will say, you're not always doing a very good job with that. Well, I'm doing better than I would have if this had happened 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you have other questions, uh, just throw them in the chat there. Um, Doug, one I'll throw out on mindset, probably the most influential book, that and leadership and self-deception in my life over the last year. Um, I've read mindset now three times. How much can you, you may not sway your disc profile, but how much can you learn about yourself? I mean, what's, how does that influence the way we operate and respond out of our profile as we begin to understand our mindset? You know, that, that's, that's almost an entirely different webinar when we start jumping into the area of, of mindset. And, and it's one that though I've read some things on, I haven't fully mined it. Um, in fact, the person who developed the desk, disc, if you took it through Crosspoint, uh, has done a lot more work with the mindset and has even developed an assessment tool that helps you identify, he calls it the growth propensity scale. But the, the fixed mindset causes us to be rigid in how we view ourselves. And so it, it keeps us from seeing the potential we have to change it almost makes us a victim in our mindset. Uh, you know, and victims feel helpless. They just go along for the ride. And so if our, if our mindset is one that is fixed, it makes it hard to bounce back because we see ourselves as being on a raft in an ocean with a rapidly moving current. If we have a growth mindset, we see ourselves more in being in a motorboat with a high powered motor. And we have the capacity to navigate against the current. So that the mindset piece can really do a lot. Uh, you know, because my family of origin had fixed mindset, I wrestle with that. And at times I just have, have, have to talk with myself and say, this is not helpful. You got to break out of this if you're going to be able to function to any positive degree at all. Mm -hmm. Doug, we had a question come in, um, a parent asking, so as parents, how do we minimize the stress of adaptive behavior in our kids? That's probably also another webinar with somebody <laughs> who's um, an expert in child behavior. Mm -hmm. um, it's super challenging with the children piece. Uh, Gee, when one of my kids was uh, two years old, I went to a counselor to deal with my kid. I, I don't know that I'm even a good person to try to, to try to travel. My wife is a whole lot better at navigating that kind of thing with kids. I'm, I'm almost reluctant to even say anything <laughs> about that. Would you, would you say though, Doug, um, that better understanding ourselves and how we adapt probably brings awareness to how we may be then sharing some of those behaviors to our kids or creating repressive moments that later on may have to be worked out of or backed out of. Yeah, that's, that's good insight because our kids are always responding to us. You know, not only do the kids have the stress of staying at home, their, challenge, their schedule being different, their lives being different, they've also got the stress of mom or mom and dad or dad. And a lot of times they will act out in response to us acting out. And really our adaptive behavior is kind of acting out behavior. It's trying to cope 
with what we feel like is a really difficult situation. And that can spread to our kids and they can be anxious because we're anxious. Mm -hmm. So by being resilient, bouncing back, monitoring your, your behaviors so they don't become excessive or become repressed, that will probably help your kids develop capacity for navigating mm -hmm. stress and crisis as well. Mm -hmm. Any other questions um, before we uh, wrap up here? You can either just jump in and unmute and ask it or uh, throw in the chat. Uh, Doug, I know, um, of course, we do these at Crosspoint for anybody we're interviewing, hiring. In some cases, we've had to hire because we've pretty got to read because of timing and so on. Um, but these are so helpful in us understanding behaviors and how we operate and uh, fit for roles, so on. Should someone want to, you know, I know this is a, many of you probably in your corporate settings have done these. And I'm surprised at times. I try to learn from, you know, groups that hire frequently and and this is not something in place should someone want to say hey i want to understand more about these what what does that look like um and how might they go about securing something like that i know it's probably not through you um as you service probably more churches <laughs> yeah i tend to work more with churches um you know the, the whole assessment piece it's not spiritual or non-spiritual it's not business or church. It, it, it's really not relegated to one of those areas that applies to every aspect of life. It's about self-understanding as much as anything. Um, though there are counselors who are adept with some tools that have recess, assessment components to them that can help you process some things. Um, there are resources on the market that can help with certain tools. There are assessment packages, like uh, if you did the DISC, you got on with uh, Crosspoint, you got on the True Wiring website. And um, colleague, one of my trainers, Greg Wines, developed a battery of assessment tools. I think there's about five of them that Greg has developed that we use. And they tell us different things about ourselves that you can engage in just purely from self-discovery. Um, and periodically, you will find offered online or find through business training, uh, further training in things like the DISC or motivators or values, um, how to deal with conflict, you know, the whole realm of crucial conversations. Uh, there's a book by that title and a lot of work that Vital Smarts has done. It's amazing how much self-understanding can occur through being engaged in that. Um, I, my friend Greg Wines does professional assessments for people. So if you really wanted to go hog wild into it, you could contact him and he can spend <laughs> four to seven hours with you. And Kurt, you've been through some of that. You know, yeah. it can be a, a little bit grueling, but extremely helpful at the same time. Yeah, so if that's something you're interested in, you can email uh, myself, Chris, we can we can point you that way. Um, it's It's been one of the probably the most single most uh, specific growth points in my life. Um, and, and Doug, if he were talking my assessment, he would tell you that I started in the negative realm on many of my assessment, <laughs> assessment uh, lines and, and, and growth is possible. You really can grow. Um, he chuckles at me every now and then that Kurt Walters can grow. And uh, so uh, it's, it's very, I, again, I nerd out on this, but this is a realm where if we really want to be better, not just in people we lead, but our kids, with our relationships, with our family, with our spouses, I mean, all the way around. Um, so, so important. Um, so, and you being on this call today just means obviously that you care about self-discovery and growth. So uh, very excited to see so many of you on here today. Um, I don't see any more questions in. If you do want the PowerPoint from today, um, Chris, uh, just email Chris, his email is there, and we can send that to you. And I believe we recorded. Um, is we that did. right, Chris? Yep, yes. yep. So, so we, we started, started right recording, mm -hmm. yep, right at the beginning. So as soon as we hit the, uh, as soon as we hit the slides, we got a recording. So um, Doug, I, I know you've asked for it as well, but if anyone had to jump off early, or maybe even you just want to go back and rewatch it with the, uh, the slides, you're welcome to do that. We can get that to you as well, so. Awesome. All right. Well, guys, thank you. Thank you, Doug, again, for uh, building into us today. And uh, hopefully it's been helpful. Uh, it's been our goal through these, these sessions is just to continue to equip, um, you know, as we, as we lead, whatever realm that is, in our families, in our community, in our jobs. 
And so uh, thank you, Doug, for uh, building into this community today. You're welcome. Yeah, awesome. All right, guys, enjoy your day, your afternoon. We'll see you.